Hello and welcome to another session of PWS H24. My name is Justin Grody. I am a data center solutions architect with Allied Digital and a Microsoft MVP. And today I'm going to be going through uh, optimizing Visual Studio Code for PowerShell. Uh, this is going to be a session on really getting into some of the nitty gritty, leveraging a lot of the experience that I've had with Visual Studio Code, which is a lot. I started, uh, I've been using ISC for a long time and a couple other editors, but then when VS Code came along a couple years ago, I really jumped on board, really forced myself to really get into it and uh, go through all of the pain of learning it. And I hope to share off some of those lessons with you today. So why Visual Studio Code PowerShell uh, together? Um, Visual Studio Code is, as most of you probably know by now, is just sort of like, it's this, it's a text editor on steroids as a way. It's like, it's not really an IDE, but it's got so much power and so much configurability and is really nice um, uh, tool for editing really anything. So whether it's JSON or text or Markdown or C Sharp or Python or PowerShell. And uh, the uh, Microsoft team, as well as the PowerShell team in particular, really saw the power and momentum that this uh, editing tool was getting early on and made a very powerful, very comprehensive extension. Um, Tyler uh, leads that current effort and he's doing a great job along with the PowerShell team to really add features to that and make it really effective and really powerful. So uh, the main reason we have here is that it makes will make you faster, more effective, and better at developing code. So this session is gonna skip over some of the real basics around VS Code, as well as basics around things like Git and GitHub, just for the interest of time. Uh, to go through those, here's a couple places I recommend getting started. If you're not familiar with VS Code at all, um, this is a great intro video, as well as an intro video done by Tyler, who writes the extension for the PowerShell extension, uh, <laughs> writes the PowerShell extension for VS Code. And uh, these are great uh, starters there to get, these are good articles to get started on that information. And once you're ready to go a little bit further, uh, we have a couple additional videos. Again, Tyler did a great presentation going through some of the more detailed information, some of which I'll cover here, uh, but really will help you get on ramps into using Visual Studio Code as your default PowerShell editor. Also, uh, Scott Hanselman has had this excellent, excellent series. The uh, Bob, We call him the Bob Ross of uh, computing, uh, and he will very nicely guide you through some things like Git 101, um, and he even has a really nice section there in just doing basic text editing with VS Code, but learning maybe some tips and tricks and keyboard stuff that maybe you didn't know that'll just help you type faster and help you everywhere, not just in PowerShell. And uh, so I highly recommend that series as well. So again, as we go back to VS Code and PowerShell, uh, this is the, these are the lessons that I've learned as part of this and how I set up my environment and the lessons that I've learned that really helped me be really effective and really powerful in producing good PowerShell code. So as a result of that, the things I have here are opinionated. And as mentioned, you know, these are just my opinions. So you may disagree. You may have particular styles you like. I'm happy to have those discussions, especially. I hope to have this session be a little bit short so we can have discussion in the chat or maybe live um, about some alternatives. But this is basically just my opinions. And there's everybody has their own styles, different strokes for different folks. And so just uh, get that out of the way right up front. This is not a religious prescriptive way of doing things. It's just what works for me. So when we combine PowerShell and Visual Studio Code, um, there are a few areas that I'm gonna to cover today that will really help you get supercharged into really using this and really making it powerful for you. One of which is something that I developed uh, recently. It's the PowerShell Extension Pack. Uh, this is a collection of VS Code extensions that you can just simply install one extension that will install the rest of them for you and really help you get started and get rolling right away. Another thing is to go through is our PowerShell Profile. Um, there are things that we can optimize in there to make life a little bit easier with VS Code, um, th theming and special commands and whatnot, and so we'll get into some of that as well. Um, we'll go into a lot of the settings tweaks. Uh, VS Code has lots and lots and lots of built-in settings, hundreds of them. Every extension provides its own custom settings, and this will both be a demonstration of the settings that I like, as well as giving you an idea of how to find those settings, how to change them, and tune and tweak the environment just how you like it so that you can be as productive as you have. And once you've got all that set up, you don't want to lose it, or maybe you work on multiple machines, 
and you want to keep all that in sync and not have to set everything back up yet. So we'll go through the new built-in setting synchronization that is now built into Visual Studio Code. So let's go ahead and get started with the PowerShell extension pack. So the PowerShell extension pack is a VS Code extension in and of itself. It's sort of a meta extension. That is an extension that just installs extensions. Um, these are actually pretty easy to build. There's plenty of great documentation on them. Um, but I'm going to skip over that part of it and just go to the installation. So here I have a default installation of Visual Studio Code. And in fact, I want to show you something that you may not know about. Uh, if I go to a folder here, um, I have actually just downloaded Visual Studio Code just to actually just a few minutes ago into a folder. So I downloaded the zip, which you can get the zip and download it and extract it into a folder. And so you can see here I have uh, all my all the files that are here. It's just the Visual Studio Code and the code here. And so what you can do, and I actually need to close this because I forgot to do it. Uh, go ahead and just do a new folder and name this folder data. And if you do that, that basically tells Visual Studio Code that you want to run in portable mode. So rather than save the data on your system in your app data, or if you're on Linux in your sort of user share folder, it will save everything about your session or this particular instance of code in this data folder. So this instance of Visual Studio Code is now portable. You can save it to a USB drive. You can... Uh, you can you know, copy it up to a OneDrive folder. So if you like are like me who work for an MSP and you always want to have your ready to go uh, Visual Studio Code in a place that you can just get it and run it and it's all pre-set up how you like it, then this is a great option for doing that. Um, setting The new setting synchronization tool um, really helps with this, that this is less necessary as it used to be. But if you need to go offline or you're working in an environment where you know they don't have internet access so you can't use the sync tool, this is a great alternative option. So now that I've created that data folder, I'm just going to go ahead and reload Visual Studio Code. And here I have the default startup for Visual Studio Code. This is what it looks like if you've loaded for the first time, you've never loaded it before. And so in my data folder, you'll see now it's starting to remember my extensions, tracking my user data. Everything about my thing is now just being kept in this one folder. Pretty neat. So um, first thing I'm going to do is with uh, control shift P, turn on screencast mode so you can see when I'm doing keystrokes and such. So now that I hit control shift P, you can see that that's what I did. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to do is increase the zoom level a little bit so that you, it's more clear what's going on. And so here we have a default installation. And so the first thing we're gonna do is for that extension pack, we are going to search for the PowerShell extension pack. And if I can spell right, that would help even better. So it comes up so far third in the list. I don't know why Java extension pack comes up ahead of PowerShell for the PowerShell extension pack, but hey, I just put the thing up there, so we'll see. Um, here you can get information once you have that, and you can see information about the extension pack. And most importantly, it'll show you here everything that the extension pack is going to install. So you can see all these different ones. And maybe you don't want everything that I include. Maybe you just want subsets. So you have your little install buttons here where you can just pick and choose the things that you want that I recommend. Um, but for instance, by default, we'll just go ahead and pick everything. We'll click Install. And then this is going to go ahead and download all those extensions and install them. And I'll just show with Task Manager here, just showing the uh, network performance here of it just uh, pulling down all that information and then installing it. You can see my disk little SSD here going crazy on my Surface laptop. And so we're just going to wait for that to install here for a minute, but you'll start seeing, oh, we got some new icons showing up here. All these extensions are all installing together, which is great. Saves us so much time having to go out, find them, install them ourselves. Um, but you also have the flexibility of installing even more extensions beyond that once that gets done. I'm just going to go ahead and pause this recording for just a second while uh, that gets installed and then we'll resume. All right, so now that that is installed, uh, we got a bunch of extra new icons over here. We had a couple like welcome, check this stuff out icons and all that kind of stuff. Um, we'll go through some of this here in a minute, but I'm just going to go ahead and close down a bunch of this stuff for now and just kind of get back to my sort of nice little starting point here. So we got a bunch of new icons, we got all this stuff, but again, before we move forward, the first thing that we're going to want to do, as, as I discussed, is now we have our PowerShell pack installed, and so we're going to want to move on and go ahead and get those setting sync set up so that we can make sure that whatever we do here gets backed up and is synchronized so that if our computer gets destroyed or we want to go to another area, we already have that synced to an account. 
So we will go back to uh, Visual Studio Code. Um, I am going to sign in here with my GitHub account, which I've already signed in. Um, you can also use, you can use either GitHub login or a Microsoft login, and it's your choice. You can choose either. You can, um, it just depends on where it stores it. It either stores it in a special GitHub storage or a special storage for your Microsoft account. Um, it's either or, it doesn't really have, um, you know, it's just kind of your preference. They both work the exact same. I tend to use the Microsoft for my um, work one because our work logins are all Azure Active Directory, so I just use that one. Um, so, but then I'm just gonna go ahead and turn on setting sync here. It's gonna let you know that this is still a preview feature, but it works pretty well. I've been using it with the VS Code Insiders for quite a while now, and I haven't had really too many issues with it. Um, there's plenty of documentation about it, including like if there are certain settings you don't wanna sync, like they're specific to your local machine, all that kind of stuff, all that detail is there. But we're gonna go ahead and turn it on here. So it's gonna pop up and ask me which things I want to synchronize. So def definitely I want my settings, uh, my keyboard shortcuts. I like having those synchronized. Uh, any sp custom snippets I have. Snippets are little pieces of code that you might write that you're like, you type that thing over and over and over again. You just want to type like three letters to bring up that code again. Um, your extensions, the actual full extension information about them and which ones you want to have installed on each system as well as the UI state. So there are some things that don't get managed by settings, but things like moving windows around and uh, uh, hiding things under other things and just rearranging your screen that don't really get controlled by um, the, the settings file. And so that's a matter of maintaining those. So usually I have no reason to uncheck any of those. I'm just going to go ahead and take them all. I'm going to use my GitHub account. And you'll see that the sync will start. Uh, this is a custom one that I have here. So I'm just going to go ahead and merge it. I cleared it earlier, so there shouldn't be too many changes here. And you can see the whole details of the synchronization. So again, because I cleared it before, haven't been any changes. And so um, that's, you know, this is just a basic starting setup. And now as I make changes, uh, this sync will automatically keep things in sync and keep my stuff backed up, which is great. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and move on to getting to the next section that we wanna take care of. So now we have our settings sync. The next thing that we want to do is actually start tuning, tweaking, and customizing our environment how we want it. So I'm going to go back to my uh, Visual Studio code here, and let's start going through some of the settings that we can tweak. And I'm going to go ahead and first thing I'm going to do is what are the possible things you can tweak? Well, now that I have all these things installed, I can go to default settings after hitting Control Shift P. And here's a list of all the settings and what their possible options are and any help that's involved in them. As you can see, there are a lot of them. If I scroll this file, this file, which is automatically generated, has over 5,881 um, lines. So that's you know thousands and thousands of settings that you can tune, tweak. And this is one of the really great things about VS Code is it's so good about like not telling you how to work. If you wanna do your work a certain way, you know, go for it. If there's some things you like, great. Some things you don't, change it. And uh, the whole philosophy around VS Code and a lot of the extension authors follow that is that there's no one right way to do it. And if, you know, whatever your preference is, whatever makes you most efficient for what you work on, um, you have the ability to change it. So again, these are my opinions. This is what works best for me. Feel free to change any of this to however you like it. So that's the default settings. Um, another way to view this is with Control Shift P is just opening the settings view with the UI. And if you're a little less about the command line, you just kind of want some nice wizards, that's all here too. Again, same information, um, all that information about these settings and all the details here. So at that level, let's go ahead and open my little prescriptive file here. So this is just going to be a settings file, which will have the detail that I'm looking to uh, set up for my settings. And then I'm also going to open my current settings in the JSON mode and split this to the right so that now we can see uh, the settings that are going to be added as well with my preferred settings. And then what will be nice here is VS Code tends to update as we make these changes in real time. So as I put the settings over here, VS Code will go ahead and apply those settings as we go. So let's go through some of the first settings here. These are just kind of general VS Code settings and let me uh, go ahead and uh, I'm going to move this one over a little bit here and blow this up just a tiny bit so that that's pretty legible, should already be pretty legible, but um, actually I'm gonna go ahead and take this down just a little bit. So first one I'm gonna do is uh, 
This is, I think, the most important setting you can do in Visual Studio Code um, is changing your work bar so it's on the right. So when I save that change, you notice this work bar moved over here to the right. This is a huge difference because normally when it's on the left, I'll go ahead and comment this back out again, move it back. You'll notice whenever I click here, my code moves. So if I'm doing something, I want to look at something, oh, I got to move my eyes and I got to move back. So for me, this is always really jarring. I'm just like, no, I'm trying to do something over here and I can't, my code's constantly moving back and forth. Well, if I put this setting in here and save it, now when I do this, my code stays in the same place. So I can do this, do my searches, do any source control stuff I need to do, and it all stays in the same place, which is great. It's super useful and really helps you stay focused on what you're doing um, without impacting your work as you need to do these side things from time to time. So very, very important setting, highly recommend it. Um, another thing is there's this little mini map here which kind of shows you your code in a nice little kind of like a uh, gutter view. So for navigating your code, like if you're looking at a code base and you kind of have a general idea of where you are, this is kind of helpful to get to things. I don't really use this. I tend to use like go to function. And if I'm familiar enough with my code to see it in this view, I'm generally familiar enough to know generally which line to scroll on. So I generally just kind of consider this wasted space. So by putting this in here, that goes away. And now I have more screen space to focus on my code and don't have to worry about that so much. Uh, another simple setting, um, debug on task errors. Uh, tasks are things that when you set up in Visual Studio Code, like starting up Azure Functions or starting up a linter, and then you want to start debug after that. Um, a lot of times it'll pop up annoying um, pop-ups if this doesn't quite start up right, or maybe you have errors that you want to ignore, and those pop up a bunch. They tend to annoy me. I like to live dangerously. It doesn't really affect anything when I'm just debugging, so I go ahead and turn that on. Uh, some additional settings. Um, as far as column selection, this is a way to do uh, selecting columns where it selects them in big, long vertical sections as opposed to highlighting like this. I'm not a fan of it, so I turn that off. Uh, extension recommendations. When you install some extensions, there's a setting extension authors can do that say, hey, if you like this extension, you can install all these other extensions. And so I typically at this point know what extensions I want, so thanks but no thanks. Um, some editing stuff here. Um, I like to use VS Code as my diff editor for not just VS Code stuff, but for like when using Fiddler or when doing Git differentials. And very often, especially when working with Fiddler and during raw HTTP requests, white space matters. A white space in a, in a request in one place that doesn't exist in the other, like a trailing white space, can cause the request to fail versus work. So that's something where I tend to want to see that white space in a diff and have it not ignore it. And so I go ahead and add that in. Uh, some other items here. Um, so as far as fonts go, here we've kind of had the default font so far. There's this font called Cascadia Cove. So Cascadia Code, as you see here, is sort of the new the Windows terminal font and also a new font that Microsoft developed. It's really nice. I like how it looks. Um, there's a fork of it called Cascadia Cove, which if you just Google it, you'll find it. But that fork basically adds a whole bunch of extra symbols and emojis and uh, and ligatures and things. Basically, it, it makes it supercharges that to work really well and allow you have all kinds of cool console stuff and prompt features and that kind of stuff. So I uh, installed this separately, uh, which you can go out and download and install it. And then this just sets it up my fonts for both my editor and my debug console to use that. And I also want those cool font ligatures. So to demonstrate what a font ligature is, is I'll go ahead and bring up my terminal here. So my PowerShell terminal by default, you'll see it kind of has this squiggly line in this weird little box. That's because uh, I have a special custom prompt, which we'll get into here in a second. But those characters that I use in the prompt are not present in this default font. So, but if I take this and I go ahead and add them in, if I copy the right thing. And just to demonstrate what a ligature looks like, notice my equal and arrows here just looks like an equal and arrows as you would expect. Let's see where I messed up here. Need a comma there. Hit save. And you see that my editor changed to this so that now, and I haven't updated the terminal font because that's later, so forget what I said here. But you'll see now that the font ligatures is true. You notice the font changed a little bit. And then we will... So you'll see the font here changed a little bit. And now I can do these things called ligatures, which they do an exclamation mark and that becomes not equals. 
that becomes that. And these are just kind of helpful to like make different symbols for various combinations of characters that you do um, more obvious. So there's more about ligatures that you can find on other things. Those will come up, etc. But that kind of sees there. So I like this font. I think this font is very nice for both the editor and console view. And so I use it everywhere. And uh, so that's that. Um, auto saving files. Because I use Git a lot, um, I'm not really, I usually don't, I usually commit changes very frequently and then upload them later. Um, so I like to have auto save on my files. So basically after 10 seconds, my files are automatically going to save. And uh, then I have that information and I don't have to worry about those files missing. And I don't worry so much about like making a change, having an auto save and oh, it broke because I can just revert my Git back to what my previous one is. So once you get comfortable with Git, once you really get used to it, you really can rely on it as a safety net and you kind of uh, keep let, let it kind of keep versions for you like you would think like with OneDrive or SharePoint, like keeping file versions as you go. And so I don't really have much compunction with turning this on, and so I like it. And so when a file is not saved, you see this little icon there. When you hit save, it'll do that. And so eventually, now that'll just turn off automatically. Uh, always remember unsaved files. Uh, I like this one. This is if my program crashes or I close the, if I just close the window or anything, if I left like an untitled file open, I want that untitled file to be back when it shows back up. I don't want any of those files to go away until I explicitly close it and hit X on it. So that's what that setting's good for. Uh, this is just a little quality of life thing. If you have multiple editors open in your thing, by default you have to kind of hold down shift to use the mouse wheel to go between them. Uh, this just removes that shift requirement. So if I put that in here, now I can just scroll the wheel without having to hold down shift. And I like that. So that's that's my personal thing. I don't need that kind of a lock. I'm, I'm pretty uh, disciplined with my wheel mouse, I think. So that's how that works for me. Um, a, another thing too is uh, I like when my workbench starts up. Like the VS Code kind of welcome is nice, but I really like to just get right to work. So when I have a new uh, VS Code window, I like it to just start at an untitled file. So when I close this, and reopen it, assuming that I didn't have anything open, which I did. Let me go ahead and close all these down. See, I like it to start just ready to go, ready to write. Like that first screen's great, show me old files, show me new things, but I've used VS Code long enough at this point that I know how to do all that stuff with Control-Shift-P, so I, I don't need it to be there. So let's get back to our editors. Again, go to my recent. There's my uh, ex existing settings and then my personal settings. Split this guy back to the right again. Whoops, let's flip that the other way. Okay, so um, other items along these. Uh, de file default language PowerShell, another very useful one. If, if your primary thing that you do in VS Code is PowerShell, you might as well make it so that when you, when you do a new file, it automatically opens it as a PowerShell file. So you can just start writing PowerShell right off the bat and you're good to go. You don't have to go down here and change it to PowerShell, any of that kind of stuff. Um, just your default new file is a PowerShell file. So I like that and that be my default. So that's why I put that there. Uh, rulers. So this has just adds a nice little line on the side. I'm gonna have to zoom out here to really demonstrate it. Let's go ahead and close this for now. But if I zoom out here a bit, uh, this just adds this nice little line here, and that's just a nice little guide. We tend to like um, 120 characters for our source files. Um, you can set this to whatever you want, 80, 120, 160, but it's a nice reminder that if I've gone this far, maybe I need to wrap it in. And PowerShell's really good with having all kinds of ways to make your code more vertical than horizontal, so it's easier to read. So it's a nice little reminder that like, hey, maybe I've written this thing too long and I need to wrap it back. So let me open my settings again. Okay, um, for IntelliSense, um, when you're writing PowerShell code uh, and the integrated console is loaded, 
when you do different commands, it will uh, provide all kinds of IntelliSense for you as far as commands that you can run. And so, but it, sometimes it'll also provide a uh, little kind of all the various text, text snippets that exist. And I don't like those. Um, I, I want to make sure that those suggestions start with um, command line items. So I go ahead and put these in so that I want to make sure that any sub snippet suggestions that come in terms of snippets, I want those to come below suggestions for like parameters or commandlets or that kind of thing. So I had to add that in. Um, I also want to prevent the quick suggestions in certain scenarios. And then this is how PowerShell behaves. Like in PowerShell at the console, if you do, you know, new item dash PA and hit tab, it auto completes to path. I like that. So I like that to happen in my editor too. So if I start a new PowerShell file and I do new item, and you know, there's those completions. Whoops, there's my shark. I don't know why this is not picking up my IntelliSense. Well, typically this will show path here. Now, if, and, and with any of these, if you hit tab, it'll do the autocomplete. Whereas normally the tab will just actually do a tab and you actually have to choose and point. Uh, control space also works for getting more information about all the ones, etc. I didn't want to say that. Go away. Uh, so we have um, another item. Um, typically, VS Code updates in the background, and so when you close it, it'll just update for you. Um, I use uh, VS Code Insiders, which is sort of like the uh, beta version a lot, and that updates pretty much daily. So I pretty much only want that to update when I tell it to update, and it'll just give me an icon down here and choose Restart to Update. So that way if I'm working on something for a project or something, I don't want to close my VS Code window and then all of a sudden open it up and it broke because of something Insiders. Thankfully that rarely if ever happens. Insiders is actually pretty stable, but this is just a safety thing that if I'm doing work, I don't want to update it till the end of the day. So I'm closing windows, opening windows, I'm not surprised. And I just know at the end of the day or to the beginning of my day, I can go down there and update it and then test to see if anything broke. Uh, for this setting, I like to, um, oh, let me blow up the uh, view again, sorry. Oh, and turn on my screencast mode, sorry about that. So I'm just hitting control shift uh, equals, or just control equals to blow up and minimize the zoom there, just as a tip there. So uh, here we have tab completion. Uh, we have enable auto detect color scheme. This is off by default, but I like it. If, my, if I switch my windows to a light theme, I want my VS Code theme to switch to light as well. In this case, it'll switch to ISE mode for me. Um, I like whenever I start a new VS Code window or a new terminal, I like to have my VS Code start maximized. I don't need it to remember where I was. If it was a smaller window and I start up VS Code again, I don't want it to remember that smaller window. I just always want it to start up full screen. That's just how I am. Um, and as far as like, if I had like 12 VS Code windows when I closed them all for work yet, the day before, I don't want it to reopen all those windows uh, if, it, if it crashed or something, because then it's got to start up all those PowerShell processes, start up all those extensions, hammers my system. I'm just going to go ahead and open the things that I needed because I probably had too many things open at that time anyways. So I like having this setting to just give me one VS Code window, start me over. And this is a nice one for um, changing how the window title works at the top. Uh, rather than a dash, it changes it to a vertical line and changes some of the separations. Like if I'm working with VS Code remoting, um, as well as what editor it is, it just makes it easier so that when you're looking at it down in your taskbar, which you can't see for me here, but in your taskbar, it's a lot easier to distinguish between different windows with this different title setting. Uh, okay, so let's move on to some terminal stuff. And by the way, this, you see how this is getting all kind of messed up? This is another nice thing. I can just choose Format Document, and my settings are all nice and clean. Nice thing about JSON. And then with one of the extensions that come in this extension pack, the JSON, if I want to, I can sort my JSON alphanumerically, all kinds of different ways, and that'll work great too. So one of the items that comes in the pack, which we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, so for my terminal stuff, uh, this just sets up the terminal so that I like a blinking cursor. I like my cursor style to be a line instead of a box. Uh, it's a box by default. I like a line. Um, uh, the font size. I like to have a lot of scroll back so I can scroll back up if I got a wall of text of errors in PowerShell or whatnot. And then some Windows customization. 
I use a tool called Scoop, which is a tool like Chocolatey or anything like that to install programs on your computer. What makes Scoop great is that Scoop installs things completely in user space. It installs them all directly in a particular folder. It updates really fast. It's a great tool for installing those little command line tools that you use kind of every day, like, like the .NET framework or uh, Nmap or any of those things where you just want to have it available at the command line. You don't need a full chocolatey install. Um, really great tool. Everything's the repositories are GitHub. I'm not going to go too much into Scoop, but I'll just show you the repository scoop.sh. It's my favorite. Um, it's my favorite uh, uh, package management tool, and it's all written in PowerShell. So I'll just bring up scoop.sh here real quick just to show you what that looks like. Um, this will give you information about it, show you the demo, install super easy. Check it out. There's my scoop plug. Sorry, chocolatey guys. I use chocolatey on here too for other stuff, but I love scoop. Um, but anyhow, this because I install my PowerShell and keep it up to date using scoop, I just need to tell um, the terminal that when I do a new terminal, I want it to be that, that scoop version of PowerShell, not like my system built in one. And I don't like having all the, uh, the, like, see all this logo and stuff coming up. Uh, usually I like to keep that pretty terse. So when I put that in here and I save it, actually put all this in here and save it. Now when I start a new PowerShell window, it just comes up with my terminal. And earlier I was mentioning when I turn on that, that Cascadia Cove setting, I forgot that requires a re restart of the terminal. And so now you see that I get this nice little arrow with my um, with my code prompt. I get the nice little uh, little ligature for power line prompts, which let my prompts look nice and pretty. And if I go to something like, well, we'll do that. We'll get into that a little bit later. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, so moving on to the next item. Um, this is one of the, so now we're gonna get into some extension specific stuff. Bracket pair colorizer is an extension that comes in the pack. I really like this because what it does is it lines up all your brackets in your PowerShell code. If you're doing like nested, a lot of nested stuff, it colorizes them so that they um, line up. And so you can see, you know, if you have a misplaced bracket, uh, this is a real common thing. PowerShell is usually not very good about, like, you usually just get this message, missing closing. I'll discuss this error lens thing here in a minute, too. Um, but I should bring this over here for a better example. Uh, so you can see if you're missing a bracket, makes it really easy to figure out where you screwed up in your brackets because, oh, these brackets don't align. So this, is, this has saved me so many times with all kinds of stuff from JSON to PowerShell. And again, this is a PowerShell file, so, I mean, you know, if I make these hash tables and that kind of stuff, all that works. It works with parentheses too. Just really nice, really nice little thing that makes a huge difference. Um, now there is a different um, colorizer out there. This one I like the best because it uses the native um, VS Code colorizer. And so it's really fast, really effective, um, and really powerful. Um, so a couple of these settings, I just like, what these do is these make it so that um, this little thing is called the ruler over here. So you notice when I click true, it showed me very easily everywhere where true existed. Same thing if I like highlight cursor style, if that doesn't exist anywhere. Um, really nice little thing to line up. So what this does with this setting enabled, which I'll go ahead and take these and stick them into my system. Also, um, it does sometimes conflict with the built-in one. I think this has been fixed recently, but I still turn this on because VS Code has some of its own built-in matching bracket stuff that um, I prefer this extension. So I tend to turn that off too. So by putting that in there, now you'll see, um, if I didn't completely break everything, I might need to reload my VS Code here. I do have bracket pair colorizer, right? Yep, that's there. Oh, there it goes. Okay, it just took it a second. Okay, so uh, da, da, da. Um, so by enabling that, you'll just see over here, you see how the now it shows blue and purple? So it makes it really easy if you have like a really long code file. Again, trying to figure out those bracket problems. It's like, oh, this is a missing bracket. Oh, I can't find that. Where's the next closest one? Okay, it's down here. 
And now I find that matching. It's like, oh, okay, I screwed up and I didn't put enough of these brackets in there. Or I, I put, in this case, I didn't leave a trailing one. And then that fixes it. So again, that just shows that really makes it easy to figure out how these brackets align. That's what that setting does. Pretty helpful. Uh, these are some Git and GitHub items. In the interest of time, um, I'm not going to go through too much of this, but I do recommend the pull request extension, which is a new GitHub extension. It's really nice. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and open a folder. Start. Start this up in a new folder. We'll call this PRCH24 examples. And so a lot of those settings are related to this pull request extension, but I'm just going to show you real quick why this is so cool. Is I'm just going to go. Typically, when you make a new repository, if you're signed into GitHub, and which I probably need to do here real quick, sign into GitHub pull requests, and just off screen here, I'm just doing a login to GitHub. Allow it to go get me a pack token. Okay, so now I can see all my pull requests and issues around this guy. And so I just I just made this a folder. And so now I can do publish to GitHub. Allow it to do what it wants to do here real quick. Uh, what do I want to name it? Make it a public repository because I'll put my examples in here and my settings things. Uh, we can go and just select this because it's a default. And just like that, this is now a uh, project on GitHub. So if I go to my GitHub, there it is. I just created that just now. I didn't pre-create that. All I did was make a new folder and click publish to GitHub. So great extension. Check it out. I'm not going to go too much into that today, but that just gives you an idea. But while I'm here, why don't I go ahead and copy over my fancy new settings files. and the presentation so you guys can get that later. Okay, so there's my example settings again. Let's go ahead and close this. And again, see, doing this doesn't affect my code over here. That's why I like it on the right. I don't know why that's, I think that's not the default because I think VS Code default or Visual Studio defaults on the left, keep people ha comfortable, but um, that's just, again, my preference. So let me split right again here. And then open my default settings. Nope. Oh, and see, I got these backwards. Again, VS Code is really nice about letting you just move this stuff around. So no worries. Okay. Um, so let's get back down here. So yeah, so this is a lot of Git stuff for there. Um, a couple extensions which I would like to go through here is, for instance, Git Graph. Now that I have um, an actual Git repository, I can click Git Graph and see, uh, I guess I, don't, I haven't actually committed anything. So that warning, I'll have a setting later that makes that warning go away because it annoys me. And so now I have this, and it'll show you a graph of your commits if you have multiple branches. If I make a new branch, test, and make this commit test two. Make it, I'll just make it an empty commit real quick. You see in real time, it shows you what's happening with your Git. So if you're a visual person, really helpful for knowing what's going on in Git. Lots of other tools do this greatly, but this helps you have it right here in VS Code. And it's not just read-only. You can do checkouts, rebases, all that fun stuff. Great extension to have. And the more information about that gets tied in through Git Lens. And so Git Lens kind of gets you that even more about getting blame information. Hey, who made this change? Oh, I made that change. Or so-and-so made that change. 
all that detail. Again, not enough time to go too much into that right now, but just kind of give you an idea of that. Uh, so we're just going to skip through these settings, but these are just think more settings that I like to have. I like to make sure that auto, auto I'm always up to date with my GitHub repository so that if somebody else made a commit, I want it to always grab it. Whenever I, I commit something, I want to do a push, uh, rebase. I like to do squashes when doing merges, um, all that kind of stuff. And then Git lens, I like to have my Git lens here under my source control view. So I'm going to take all this and throw it in to my settings. And again, I forgot to turn on screencast mode again. Sorry about that. Take all this stuff, throw it in here. Now, I don't have this GitHub Act and this GitHub Actions extension I don't have in my default pack because you may not be using GitHub Actions, but it is a great extension and this just enables auto refresh. So you can watch your GitHub Actions in real time run and see if they complete it or not without having to go to the GitHub portal back and forth all the time. Really helpful. Anyhow, now that I've just done that, uh, rather than have the Git lens as a separate button as you saw here before, now it's all just here under my source, which I like. I like to be able to just go here and look at my repositories because I want everything involved with source control being under this source. And so I typically also take like my pull requests and issues and do the same thing. I take my issues and just bring it here under source control. And there it is. And again, that state thing will remember that. And so I take my pull requests, do the same thing. And so now that icon goes away because now I have my pull requests and issues just visible right here. So nice, nice way to organize things. Okay, let's get into the good stuff, the PowerShell stuff. So PowerShell, I have a custom path for where I want my integrated console to run. So this is just kind of a nice thing. It will usually detect it, but you don't need to do that. And so here's where we get into the code formatting. So these are code formatting settings that I like. Um, I like my aliases corrected. These are basically non-default settings. There's many more settings to tune and tweak, but this is my non-default settings I like. I like autocorrect. I like braces to open on new lines. I want uh, opening braces on the same lines. Um, I like it that if I write a double quoted string, and it doesn't have um, it doesn't have any variables or anything in it. I want when I do a formatter to just convert that to a single quoted string. Um, it's just that way I can basically just always write in double quotes and it'll automatically figure it out for me. Uh, other main setting here, um, there are many uh, opinions on different ways to do brackets and such like that. I like the one true brace style, which basically will open brackets on new lines. And you'll see this when I do a, a formatting. Um, but basically, whether you want your bracket on the same line as your function, whether you want it to be a new line, any of that kind of stuff, th there are lots of different ways to do that. This just helps however you want to format your code. You can even define custom formats. Um, this controls that. Uh, I don't like I don't like this banner. You know, like it's 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 cute, but I don't need to know it, so I I like to keep it clean. That goes away. Um, this is some pester stuff because I use pester five. Turn that off. I don't need it to prompt me to update PowerShell because I update that with Scoop separately. Um, I like my default version to actually be Windows PowerShell 5.1 when I start new projects because a lot of my stuff I need to do is 5.1 compatible. But on a per project setting in the workspace settings, you can override this. So I have some projects where my default 7. Um, I don't like this command explorer on the side here. I don't ever use it. So I just turn it off with this. Um, and on Linux, I want my I use my PowerShell as a login shell a lot, so I want to have that. Um, these little run buttons, if you have a PowerShell script started, um, show up here. They're nice, especially if you use ISC. These are really comforting, feely, and fuzzy, but I never use them. I always use F5 and F8 as they show here, so um, it's just wasted space to me. Um, and then here's the thing that um, goes under the radar a bunch, but not sure that a lot of people know about, is typically with launch configurations, you're defining them inside a project. And most of the documentation puts it that way in terms of like how you debug. But you can actually define those in your user configuration file and then they're available globally. So even though I haven't defined a launch JSON, I can have all my run commands available to me. So right now, see there's no configurations and typically I have to do add configuration and do all that stuff and it drops it in the folder. If I take um, all this stuff and put it in, specifically the launch configurations, and 
because I just changed my PowerShell, I like to do a new session. So now that I put those launch configurations in here, and unfortunately I hit the bug where I had a key typed in here and my PowerShell froze, so pause a second while I bounce my power. All right, and we're back. And so to uh, reiterate now in my debug here, or when I go to run debug, I now have this dropdown. I have all these ready to go for interactive session, run the current script, run it with arguments, run my pester tests wherever they are in the system, or attach to an existing pester session if I'm doing things like Azure Functions. And I don't have a task JSON defined here. It's just now whenever I do, or if I'm even not even have a folder open, I have these debug options available to me. So really handy, really useful to put in your user settings. And since I use settings sync, everywhere I go has these ready to go. So for all those formatting options that I added, let me go ahead and do a new PowerShell and pick up an example out of my existing. So here's an example of a very tersely written PowerShell script. And you can go ahead and write this manually. Um, but you have things like, if you can read this, this just basically, um, basically set, makes a hash table with the variable test, expands it out to just get test, and then write what I expanded out. So if I copy this and I put it in my terminal, it works fine. But what I can do here is now that I've turned on all that formatting, I can do format document and it will expand it. Expand to the pipeline, change the question mark to where object, change the percent to for each, change that right alias to right output, put all the brackets in the right place. If I do these on new lines, or excuse me, do this uh, new lines non fancy style. If I do it on new lines and format it, notice how it automatically indates the brackets or by the pipeline. So you can have this, and then there's a setting you can enable which I don't have here, which is format on save, where you can do this, edit as you go, and then when you save, it'll automatically do it. So you can write super shorthand, and then when you save, have it in a format that's nice, legible, avoiding aliases like we always harp on, that's ready to go for your, um, uh, for your code base. And if you work with other people, there's a new setting that was added to VS Code very recently, if you have the latest version, that let, will only format the sections of code that you have changed, which is great for uh, doing pull requests. Like if you're doing a pull request to a repository and maybe they don't, they haven't formatted all their code, this will just format your section of code that you're adding, which is great. So uh, now we're getting down into the theming stuff. Um, one thing I like, I really like the default theme of VS Code as you've seen. There's lots of crazy themes, Dracula, et cetera, uh, Solarized, and those are all great. But there's something about the default theme that I just really like. I like the black, I like the colors that are involved. It works really well for me. It may just be that I'm using it. But there are some little inconsistencies. Like for instance, the terminal down here isn't quite accurate. The bracket pair colors don't quite match um, what's in the terminal. So I do a little bit of theme. These are some theming tweaks that exist. So I take these. This is for bracket pair colorizer. This is for indent rainbow. Let me close this so it's a little more obvious. Turn on my screencast mode again. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, and then some color corrections for both error lens, which I'll show here in a second, and um, the actual terminal. So these are all just colors that I've painstakingly gone through and customized to make things so that everything lines up and everything matches. Um, and then Peacock, which I probably won't have time, time to demo today. Peacock is a way of putting like different colored boundaries on different projects. So you can have one project with a pink outlined VS Code, another project with a red outlined VS Code. Great if you're working on multiple projects and you don't want to mix them up at the same time. Um, but I'm going to take that as well as the nice icon themes. I like a couple little custom icons. And I like a nice pretty blinking cursor. I'm going to go ahead and open my settings JSON. Put those in here. Hopefully it doesn't break anything. Okay, so now I have nice fancy icons. You notice my power, my PowerPoint now is a nice fancy PowerPoint icon. And if I go to um, my VS Code, now if you look, this matches this as best as I can do given limitations in um, uh, PS read line and such. And so now when I'm writing down here and I'm writing code and I do things like you know function prompt, when I copy and paste that up here, it's going to match as close as I can get it. 
So that again, having that consistency, having that highlighting consistency helps me be more productive because I'm expecting things to look a normal way. So I also mentioned something called error lens. So typically when you have problems with your code, you see it down here in this little problems box. I like to have it more immediate. And so this error lens thing will take these errors and put them right here next to where the problem is. Really helpful when you're developing quickly um, to find issues. And it also works with suggestions. So if I make a parameter that's uh, named password, uh, it's always running uh, all the script analyzer stuff and it lets me know, hey, you know, you really should use secure string. This shouldn't just be a string. That's a, that's a bad practice. But I, I, I get told it the second I write that code as opposed to maybe seeing it down here. Oh, okay, maybe I should fix it, all that kind of stuff. It's like, okay, fine, make it a secure string for me. Great, and then that goes away. The default colors are really strong and really bold. So that's where some of this theming comes in is I like it to be a little less in your face. And so that's where... Uh, this theming comes in, these uh, error lens colors. Okay, so that handles the color theming, and that covers most of the main things. This is just some SSH remoting stuff. I'm not going to have time to really go too much into VS Code remoting, but definitely check that out. Really helpful. I'll do a separate session later on um, how to set up for container development with PowerShell. Um, but that kind of gets you there where you need for the settings. So that is the very long portion of the presentation of which is the settings tweak but now you're at a place where you have this and you also now have it synced so you can go to another vs code start it up just sign into the settings sync and it will set it all up just how it was in fact i'm going to demonstrate what that looks like right now